Oh, no. He said, you don't know. Now sit you down and I'll tell you. I said, well, all right. What is it? He says, well, the sun never sets on the British Empire because the good Lord would, would never trust the British in the dark. <laughs> and lastly, my grandmother from uh, Woodford in County Galway. Um, she had uh, a lilt, but she also had a strong social conscience, consciousness. And uh, she knew all the poems and the songs, and she, she loved the, the one about the veil of Avoca. And you can finish the first verse with me. I'll, I'll allow that. Uh, to, uh, uh, there's not in this wide world a valley so sweet as the veil of Avoca where the bright waters meet. That was Tom Moore, of course. Now, there are lots of other verses, but uh, she, t she tacked this one on, and this is why I mention it. But if you're lying by the ditch with a blanket or sheet, you won't give a damn where the bright waters meet. Okay? <laughs> so if you're pumping money and money and money into imperialism and wars, uh, you're not doing what Tom Paine and what the Vale of Avoca can evoke in terms of justice. Sorry. Ah, good. All right. There we go. Now, uh, we Veterans for Peace have a delegation here in Ireland. Uh, maybe you saw the, the headline in the Irish Times this morning. Uh, <laughs> 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 You know, you could bring it. Well, yes. The Irish Times. Did you see the the uh, the headline in the Irish Times about two of us being arrested and imprisoned? Oh. Did you see it in any other Irish newspaper? No. Uh, did you hear it on the radio? Oh, the TV. No. There's a story there, folks. What we're talking about here is no longer the MIC, the military industrial complex. It's the Mickey Mat. Now listen carefully. It's the Military Industrial Congressional Intelligence Media Academia Think Tank Complex. Got that? Military Industrial Congressional Intelligence Media Academia Think Tank. So, Mickey Matt. They're all in it together, folks, and they're controlling the media, and no one knows that two of my friends, my dear friends, with whom I've spent many an evening in prison, are in prison in, Limer in uh, Limerick, yeah. So uh, wh what were they doing? They were trying to show how U.S. imperialism has your uh, uh, Taoiseach uh, by the, well, how do we say this? Uh, they, ha they have a lot of influence on them, right? <laughs> okay. And so they'll probably be asking, now, what should we do? And the head of the CIA station in Dublin's probably said, well, throw the book at them, throw the book at them. Make sure that they suffer for this. What were they trying to do? They were trying to show that Ireland is bowing. A hundred years after we achieved our independence, bowing to the writ of the colonialists, of the imperialists, okay? They can't resist the kowtowing or as Claire Daly says, slobbering over the U.S. president, even though it happens to be President Trump. They slobber, and they think that's okay, and they violate Irish neutrality. Now, uh, the, your leaders will say, uh, the leaders in Dublin, uh, will say, well, no, 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 no weapons come through Shannon that we know of. And so they're asked, well, how many planes have you inspected? Well, we, we trust the Americans, of course. <laughs> they trust the Americans, right? Well, guess what, folks? We have two people here from our delegation who came with their weapons in these planes, landed at Shannon with their weapons, and went on to Iraq and Afghanistan. And that's happening now with other troops coming through, and there was a plane full of about 300 of them on, on Sunday morning, St. Patrick's Day, and we found out about it. Two of us went out onto the tarmac with a big, big sign saying, uh, don't violate Irish neutrality. And so that's what matters to us, and it should matter to more people in Ireland, because people are being killed, okay? Now, 
the two that uh, were, were with us, uh, uh, Anya and Mike, I wonder if you can uh, at least uh, confirm what I've just been saying. It's a, it's a, it's a hard sell, but well, did you come through Shannon, and wh what were you carrying? Uh, yes, we both came through Shannon Airport um, back in 2003 in January, and uh, we had with us uh, M4s with the, with the majority of the Marine Corps at the time period in platoon, and um, we left the end of May going right back through there. So we did have our weapons with us to make the U.S. Shannon Airport. Mm -hmm. Little did I know at the time, uh, years later, I would be back here addressing that very same issue and um, the results from just over two and a half million soldiers that have come through Shannon Air Airport has uh, resulted in uh, you know the hundreds of thousands of deaths that we have uh, witnessed in Iraq. And this is just two of us that we can attest that uh, the atrocities there are um, extraordinary. Um, we conducted a lot of raids in Baghdad and I would say over half of the, in, the intelligence, 50 to 60% of the intelligence that we got was just flat out wrong. So the majority of these uh, doors that we were kicking into were uh, you know, the doors of homes of families and the constant uh, screams that you hear from the women, the uh, little girls, the, it, it hit you right here, right here in the heart. Uh, very hard coming back and having to face the reality that that's what I supported. Although at a young man joining the military at 18, my heart, I felt like my heart was in the wrong, the uh, right place, but I was manipulated by the United States war machine to further per per perpetuate the, uh, their imperialistic agenda. Major, would you like to add something to that? And you, you have an appointment with the Taoiseach right there in Dublin uh, tomorrow, is that correct? Does he want to talk to you? Not likely, huh? Not likely. <laughs> Just like the Irish Times. Thank you so much. Um, here's a little photo that I... Don't know if I can enlarge or not, but uh, when Mike and Enya talk about kicking down doors, if you can see the little girl there, and you see the, the GI with the camouflage thing on there, and you see the, the little brother in there, uh, you can't see the little brother is looking on in a different photo. But uh, what does that do to that girl's life? What, her, her parents had just been shot at a uh, traffic stop, and she survived, and she survived till today. Uh, but, you know, what does that do to the GI? W the fellow with, with, the, with the leg there, w what does that do to him? There's moral injury here, folks. There's deep moral injury. And you shouldn't be letting them, or the people in the South should not be letting them get through Shannon to do these things. Now, I'll, I'll raise one little hopeful sign, and that is that we do drones, too. And we can't do drones all alone. We need help. And we get them from the Germans. The Germans have a base in Rammstein. Some of you know this. There is a satellite relay station in Rammstein. So these people watching the drones and watching the suspected terrorists in Afghanistan or Somalia or wherever are in Nevada next to Las Vegas. They go there at night, okay? So they're looking at the screens. Ah, fellow looks like a terrorist. Yeah, 
Okay, and so they say, yes, it looked like a tourist to me. They push a button, it goes to Rammstein, the satellite relay station, and it hits whoever looks like a terrorist in Somalia or let's say Yemen. And how long do you think that takes? Anyone? How many? Three seconds. Three seconds, and Rammstein is critical to that. Now, why do I mention that? Because a member of the family who, left, who lost two family members in Yemen sued Germany. This is sovereign territory, and you are an accomplice to a crime. And the German court has agreed to hear the case. That's the news today. And so the Germans, who want to turn a blind eye to that, but also say that that's German sovereign territory, are going to have to deal with the fact that they're being used for these war crimes, okay? Now, what about Shannon? Well, Shannon should face the same music, in my view. So uh, that's, that's the good news. Now, I want to show you, uh, that we're talking about regime change of a certain kind in Iraq, very violent. Uh, there's, here's a, there's a regime change that I could not believe uh, was so blatant because it was advertised on YouTube 20 days before the, the regime change. I'm talking about the one in Kiev, Ukraine, okay? And here's a very brief, uh, very solid uh, quotation of a telephone conversation intercepted between our Assistant Secretary of State, Victoria Nuland, and the ambassador in Kiev, uh, Jeffrey Pyatt. You may not have heard the whole thing. Here's the whole thing. It's only two minutes, I believe. Let's see. Here it is. Oh, no. Bob Marl Conference. That's us, right? I'm going to try it again. Here we come. Can you see it all right? What do you think? Uh, I think we're in play. Um, the the uh, Klitschko piece is obviously the complicated electron here. Um, especially the announcement of him as Deputy Prime Minister. And, and you've seen some of my notes on the troubles in the marriage right now, so we're trying to get a read really fast on where he is on this stuff. But I think your argument to him, which you'll need to make, I think that's the next That's the ambassador. Up, is exactly the one you made. And that's Yachts. And I, I'm glad you sort of put him on the spot on where he fits. In that's the head of the EU and foreign I'm policy. Very glad he said what he said in response. Good. So, uh, I don't think Cleach should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess you think, well, in terms of him not going into the government, just let him sort of stay out and do his political homework and stuff. I'm just thinking, in terms of sort of the process. Hmm. All right, those are the other two contenders uh, right next to the uh, Yatsenyuk there. Uh, one is a, a world-class boxer, that's Klitschko, and the other one is a, 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 a what do you call it, a, a proto-Nazi, a talent book. So those are the, those are the three. They picked uh, Yatsenyuk like they picked the young fellow there in, in, uh, in uh, um, Venezuela just recently. And I'm sorry about this, but uh, it shows the, the vicissitudes of trying to do this kind of thing online. Well, what should I say now? Uh, try one thing here. Just moving ahead. We want to keep the moderate Democrats together. The All right. We'll give up on that. This shows, uh, just to complete it, uh, that uh, Victoria Newland, who was uh, Sec Assistant Secretary of State, 
under uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, she picked Yatz. She said, Yatz is the guy. He, he knows about austerity. He's had, he knows about economics. And he's going to make sure that uh, we can come into NATO, that is, the, Na the Ukrainians, Kenya, and so forth. So when you hear about Russian aggression, okay, you need to remember a couple of things. One of them is the fact that uh, uh, when the Berlin Wall fell, November 1979, right, okay, uh, our president said, well, we're not going to take advantage of Russia. That was George H.W. Bush. And he went, sent his Secretary of State to Moscow, and they worked out a deal. And the deal was this. Now, bear in mind, someone thanked Russia before for, for winning World War II for us, and largely they did. Uh, bear in mind that they lost 26 million, 26 million people in World War II. Now, there are lots of casualties in Europe and in Britain, of course. Uh, in the United States, not so many. Pearl Harbor, but that's it, okay? How many soldiers do we lose? About 450,000. So there's a big disparity there. The Russians have the idea that we don't know anything about war, real war, uh, on our territory, and that's true, and it's very dangerous, okay? Anyhow, the deal proposed to Gorbachev was, look, we want a reunited Germany. I didn't want to reunite Germany. I had lived there five years. It scared the hell out of me. The whole NATO structure was set up to keep the Germans separate, divided, to keep the Americans in and the Russians out. It was very clear. The first NATO general secretary said that, all right? So here's the deal they proposed to Gorbachev. Uh, you reunited uh, Germany. You pull out your 20 divisions from East Germany, and... Uh, We'll agree to make sure that the West Germans or the Germans don't adopt any nuclear weapons, and in return, we'll promise not to move NATO one inch, one inch closer to the, to Russia to the Soviet Union at the time. Now that, there were twelve nations in in NATO at the time. Now there are, I think, twenty five, and all the thirteen, if my subtraction is correct, all thirteen to the east. So we, we violated our promise. So when we overthrew Kiev, uh, overthrew the regime in, in Ukraine, well, that was the last straw. Last lesson here is that's where the Russians stopped us. That's where we stopped, all right? Later it was Syria where the Russians stopped us. And we need to realize that we can no longer dominate the whole world, okay? Because that's imperialism, and that's the idea you have with this hubris. Now, you hear in America awful lot, including from the president, um, that we're the sole indispensable country of the world. Okay. So I, I go around and I talk at colleges and universities, and I say, now, uh, do you know about uh, synonyms? And they say, oh, yeah, those are like words. Well, how about antonyms? Well, there are one or two in the class. They'll say, oh, yeah, an antonym, that's an opposite word. So what's the, what's the antonym for indispensable? And they say, well, well, it would be dispensable. I say, that's right. So the rest of the world is, by definition, dispensable. How do you suppose they feel about that? And, and do we really think that? Well, one of the slides I was going to show here shows that uh, after the World War, World, World War II, we were indispensable. We, we had domain over 50% of the world's natural resources. And we only had about one-ninth, well, one-sixth, actually, the, the po population of the world. Now it's very different, isn't it? So we're no longer in, in, indispensable. And we find out that out uh, when we get checkmated in Ukraine, when we get checkmated in Syria, when we can't even run a decent r regime change in Venezuela. You know, this, the big successes of the past in Iraq, in, in Iraq, uh, in Iran, in Chile, successes, of course, is meant. Ironically, they're, they're not going to happen anymore, okay? And so what do we do? Well, we try to expose what's going on. What's the problem? The problem is we can't get in the media. Remember the Mickey Mat? Okay, the M in the middle is the biggie. That's the new factor. In 50 years in Washington, 
I learned one thing that uh, supersedes all the others in importance, and that is we no longer have a free media, and that's big. You know, Edmund Burke, uh, when he was in, in Commons, uh, he famously said, you know, there are uh, three, three estates here, two in Commons and, and one in Lords, but there's one estate that's more important than all of us because it keeps democracy in and keeps us in check, and that's the the gentlemen, they're all gentlemen, well, they're all men anyway in those days. And he said, those are the, the men's, members of the press up there in the gallery. That's the fourth estate. Without the fourth estate, we're in trouble. We have no fourth estate now, and we're in trouble. So how do we keep going? Well, we have to, we have to kind of uh, take some joy out of the fact that uh, there is joy in, in telling the truth. There is joy in doing the right thing. I know that uh, Ken Mayers, uh, Major Ken Mayers from the U.S. Marine Corps and paratrooper Tarek Kauf are, are smiling in their jail cells in, in Limerick now because they did the right thing. They went out and they did the right thing. <laughs> and that's what we have to be prepared to do. And, uh, and to do it with some sort of sense of humor and not unrealistic expectations, you know? And going around for the last 20 years, I find out that Americans especially uh, will not try to enter on some ambitious goal unless there's a reasonable prospect of success. You know, who, who, who wants to be laughed at? Or who wants to see, oh, <laughs> what do you think you were doing you know, if, you, if you don't achieve your purpose? So what's important is uh, to realize that the good is worth doing, as my friend Daniel Berrigan used to say, because it is good. The results are not unimportant, but they're secondary to the goodness of the act. Now, in a more secular way, I.F. Stone, one of my favorite uh, publicists, said this. You have to be prepared. There are only two, two kinds of fights worth fighting for, uh, and those are the ones that you're going to lose. And you'll lose, and then you'll lose, but then one fine day, somebody is going to win. Somebody who thinks like you, somebody who will pre preserve your independence and your neutrality and your democracy, and you may not live to see it, but he's going to win or she's going to win, and uh, that's why you have to fight them in the interim. And in the, in the process, you have to take a certain delight in the fact that you may not see the results of your work, but it's there. Unless we, we end on a very murky note, I wanted to uh, recite a little poem from Yeats. You, many of you know it, so you can recite it with me, all right? It keeps my spirits up and keeps me from being rather dour, as the Irish say. <clears throat> it's about the fiddle of Dooney. Do you know it? Ah, good. When I play my fiddle in Dooney, folk dance like a wave of the sea. My brother is priest in Kilvarnet, my cousin in Bachnobui. I passed my brother and cousin. They read from their book of prayer. I read from my book of song that I bought at the Sligo Fair. We reached the end of time with Peter sitting in state. He'll call the three of us, but he'll ask me first through the gate, for the good are always the merry saved by an evil chance. And the merry love the fiddle, and the merry love to dance. And when the folk there see me, they'll run out to me, and they say, ha, there's the fiddle of Dooney, and they'll dance like a wave of the sea. So let's dance as we do justice. Thank you very much. Thank you there, Ray. He did tell me, you know, that he, uh, he's kissed the Blarney Stone on a few occasions. <laughs> right, can we have our third guest speaker now, and that's Patrick Henningsen, Patrick's publisher with 21st Century Wire. <laughs> 